We're live? Let's go. All right, let's do this. Listen, welcome to the Red Cast. I could not be more excited to kick this off, get this going. I'm Red, of course, and uh, first episode I had to get an absolute insane guest. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking, who came right to mind? This guy, first of all, statistically speaking, one of the greatest players to ever play at Rutgers basketball. Um, but what really sticks out to me, besides all the statistics, I mean, 1,500-plus points, multiple NCAA appearances, um, absolutely amazing career, but what really sticks out to me is, is the character of this guy, and so when I was thinking about who would be the first guest for this podcast and who really embodies somebody that I want to be on here and talk to and stay in contact with, you know, fortunate enough for me, I get to call him a friend, um, but I got an absolute insane guest, Geo Baker, baby. How we doing, all right? I'm good, man. I appreciate you for having me on. Dude, thank you for doing this. I, I really appreciate you coming by. Um, so, I mean, we, we go back now. I guess it's, it's been two years. We had all of last year, the year before that, which is when we really met each other. Um, and so, I guess where, where I want to start, I mean, a lot of people who are going to watch this probably already know who you are, what you've done, what you've been able to accomplish. But I guess for the people, maybe some of my friends who might not know who you are, uh, just give us a little background on who you are, you know, where you grew up, and, and how you, I guess, ended up playing for Rutgers. Yeah, so I'm Geo Baker. Um, you know, I just recently graduated from Rutgers University. I was a fifth-year senior. Uh, I was a four-year captain for the men's basketball team. I'm originally from Derry, New Hampshire, so small-town kid, like 40 minutes from Boston. Um, you know, ended up coming to Rutgers, and, you know, when we first got here, you know, wasn't a lot going on basketball-wise. We weren't very good, uh, you know, and, you know, me and my teammates ended up turning around a little bit. Uh, had a great time doing it. Also, you know, started fighting for name, image, and likeness, which is, like, another thing that I'm, I'm really known for, mm -hmm. you know, uh, college athletes and, and, you know, their rights. Um, you know, and that's, that's kind of you know, what, what brought me here now. That's awesome. So how, I guess, how did you, you're up in New Hampshire. How do you end up, I guess, you know, played all throughout, your, you know, when you were young in high school. How did you end up, you know, deciding to come to Rutgers? Yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty interesting story, actually. So my, my AAU coach in New Hampshire, um, he actually played for the Rutgers basketball coaches when they were at uh, George Washington. So he had a really good connection with them. Like, he would always praise, like, oh, Coach Pico is the reason, like, I got, you know, to this certain level. And he played pro for multiple years. Um, you know, and he just really had that trust factor. And then for me, like, my AAU coach was like a father figure to me. So, like, anything he's telling me, like, I'm trusting it 100%, you know what I mean? And, and um, you know, obviously we still went through the process and, like, I came and visited the school, um, you know, got a chance to meet some of the fans, got a chance to meet the academic advisor. And, like, the more people I just met, like, you know, it was all genuine conversations. Like, it was it was real love. Like, you, yeah. could really, you could really feel it. And, like, that's the main thing I was looking for was, like, a second home. Um, and then on top of that, Rutgers, like, again, I was just saying it, like, wasn't very good at basketball, right? And, and me coming from New Hampshire – like, I'm an I'm a underdog, like, at heart. I have to be, right? Because mm -hmm. there's no basketball players coming out of New Hampshire. And Rutgers, yeah. at the time, was the underdog. Like, they had three wins in conference play. Like, no one was no one was believing in them. No one was believing in me. So, it matched up perfectly. And, you know, I just kind of fell in love with it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I guess when, when you're coming here and you – did you get a chance to go and see a game at the rack before you – like, while you were doing your visits and everything like that? I actually never saw a game at the rack. Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw a couple of practices. I uh, went to a midnight madness, but I never, I never saw a game at the rack. That place is absolutely electric. I mean, unbelievable atmosphere in there. Well, when, when, when you come here and, and look, was Rutgers originally? Because I, I know they made the switch to the Big Ten mm -hmm. not too long ago. Were they Big Ten when you first came here? Yeah, so they they were Big Ten. Yeah, they were already when you came. Oh, so you knew you were coming yeah. into the Big Ten, good yeah. competition. Yeah, exactly. And that, like, and that's like again, like the that's the fun, you know. Like that's the stuff that I love. Like I love the idea of like, oh, we got to go against Michigan, and then the yeah. next day we got against Michigan State. Yeah, Duke, yeah, yeah. Indiana, Wisconsin. You go down the list. You're like, damn. Like these are all the these are all the schools I watched as a little yeah, kid. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And and the cool part too was not one of those schools recruited me, so it's like I don't get to show them like 
Yeah. This is what I do. Like, you you guys lost out on me, too. So yeah, that, something. That was chip on your fun. shoulder. Yeah, Want to prove something. Definitely. That's awesome. Yeah, what, what you guys were able to accomplish, and even before, you know, we opened this spot, you know, Rutgers was, okay, a basketball, obviously a big-name school, but what you guys were able to do over the, the five years that you were here, I mean, is, is absolutely amazing. And to be able to actually just – I'm lucky that I got to experience it those last two years, your last two – I mean – unbelievable you talk about that year where we first met each other um it was after the ncaa tournament and so we're watching and it was cool for me because i opened this place and i start to follow rucker sports and see what's going on and so you know i i get to follow the players see who's who and at that point i hadn't really met a lot of the sports team players and so uh you know following you guys along and then getting the chance to meet you later that year was something so special to me because I hadn't really experienced that yet. And you guys are, you know, big time in New Jersey. I mean, yeah. everybody know, was watching, especially right. that year. And, and just the change. I mean, like I said, when you go to the rack, that place is packed. And the atmosphere is absolutely electric. Um, yeah, man. It was, it, was, it was crazy just, like, seeing, seeing how we could turn it around. Because, you know, you go from our freshman year, we're like, 3-15 and 15 in the Big Ten. Mm-hmm. You know, the next year, we win, I think, seven games. Mm-hmm. And the next year, I think we won 11 games in the Big Ten. Like, you could just kind of keep seeing it building, building, building. And uh, it was just super special because, again, like, the rack now is packed, it's lit. But if you saw it our freshman year, yeah, like, I'm talking, the only time people would come is if, like, Michigan State came to the building yeah, or big games, State came okay. to the building, you know what I mean? And, like, so to see that switch was just, like, really cool because it was like, damn, we did this. Like, yeah, you know, like, yeah. And then that year, when you know, when, when we first started coming here, man, that was such a great time just because, you know, you think about the circumstances and the situation, like, like the COVID year, like, mm-hmm. We were playing in empty gyms, couldn't see anyone after the game, couldn't see our friends and family. And then, you know, once the season was over, it was like, okay, now we can unwind. And, you know, we had like a – like it was like a second family here at Reds. Like, oh, that's really what it man, felt like, that like, – That was really – you know, you know exactly that what I'm year talking was, about. That was like, – yeah, we're, we're definitely going to dive into that. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was truly a special year. Um, and – but I guess before we dive into that and go – because there's a lot of good stories from that year and, <laughs> and where it came to be. But I guess, you know, when you first came here, the core group of guys that ended up building – you know, what you guys had and what you turned the team into, the culture changers, as yeah. you guys call. What Was everybody here when you first got here? Were they all your year or how, you know, the, the main guys, the core group? So I was I was the first one to commit, um, you know, and Miles Johnson came in my year as okay, well. Yeah. He actually redshirted. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, other than him, I think, you know, Mamadou Ducor was here. Mm-hmm. Luke Nathan was here. Yeah. Um, you know, but then all those other guys, Ron, Montez, Kayla McConnell, Jacob Young, mm-hmm. um, even Miles, again, because he redshirted. So, like, they were all the next year right after. Oh, okay. And, like, you know, for me, because I was the first one to commit, like, I was, like, yo, I, I was in everyone's DMs. Like, I was in Montez's DMs. Yeah, like, yeah. like, yo, like, <laughs> you need to come to Rutgers. Mm-hmm. Like, this is what we're going to mm-hmm. do. Like, here's what we're going <clears> to <throat> accomplish. Like, and I was starting to, like, put it in their mind, like, early. Mm-hmm. Like, this isn't, like, normal Rutgers. Like, we're not coming here to lose. Like, this, yeah. is, this is our game plan. Like, this is yeah. what we're going to do. And, you know, like, the more people I would hit up, like, they would hit up their person and their person. Like, and it just kind of, like, kept building, building, building. Was was Pike, did, was he aware of your ability to be that kind of leader before you came here? Was that something that, like, you were uh, – I feel like it was something that you probably just are born with and probably exemplified throughout high school and AAU and things like that. But was that something you think that he saw before or is that just something you kind of proved to him when you got here? You know, I don't even know if it's something that I saw before, honestly. You know, I think I was always um – this might sound a little weird, but I always had, like, that, like, attraction or, like, I mm-hmm. could, like, I could walk into a room and, like, I could make friends with anybody. Like, 100%. And, and, like, same thing, like, in, bas- in basketball, it was always the same way. Like, if I was on an AAU team, like, I could recruit anybody. Like, okay. I'd be like, yo, come play for us. Like, this yeah. is what we're going to do. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that type of situation. So, I think, like, he knew I was a people person, right? Mm-hmm. So, he knew that I was going to be that type of guy where, like, I could get everyone on the same page. Like, mm-hmm. that, he knew that, but I, I don't know if he if he saw me as a leader. And I don't know if I saw myself as a leader, right? Yeah. Because I never, when I was growing up, I was never the leader. Like, I was always, um, I, was a, I was a follower. Like, yeah. I, I really was. Like, But I always had that attraction where it was like, I was a winner. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So I think there's a little bit of a difference. Like, there's a winner and then there's a leader. Yeah. And I had to learn how to be both <clears throat> yeah. um, at an early age. At okay. Rutgers. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy because I think, a lot of the guys who end up in that position, you know, first and foremost, having the skill to like on the court is such an important thing, but people don't always see the other parts because 
if you think about all the players you just named about, like, the core guys who came in with your team, everybody was extremely skilled. I mean, obviously, you saw how good. But to play together as a team and continue to win games, it goes way beyond skill. So, so it's beyond, Skill yeah. is, is – but – it does take a few pieces of, of the puzzle that people may not see. And, and one of those key pieces is always that, that, that one guy, the glue man almost, that right. holds the team together. Right. And I felt like you were that for Rutgers. And based on what you just said, like bringing all those guys in and explaining. But you also had the skill to back that up. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. But you yeah, know, it was just like, you know, everyone, everyone played a role. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, and, and you just said it perfectly. It's like, you know, people don't don't see that. Maybe they yeah. don't understand it. Like you look at a guy like Luke Nathan, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, he's this screaming kid on the bench that everyone was like laughing yeah. at, like, kind of yeah. like a meme type of situation yeah. during COVID. But if you like dive deeper, like Luke's Luke's role was super important. Core guy, I mean, super core important. Like guy. He was, he was the the starting center for our dream team. So like he knew all the other teams' plays. Yeah, he's in charge of like elbowing <clears throat> Cliff, elbowing Miles, like getting them ready for the game. Like, yeah. And if Luke doesn't show up and he doesn't do his job like yeah. to the best of his ability, then that hurts the team, right? That 100%. hurts. That, that it contributes to losing instead of winning. So yeah. like a lot of people don't see all of that. And then even just like off the court stuff, like me and Luke would always try to organize like team hangouts, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, we're all going to Reds tonight. Or, yeah. you know, we're all coming over to our place and we're going to watch this game together. And it's yeah. like, those little things matter. Like, people mm-hmm. don't people don't realize it, like, but that off-the-court stuff, like, it, it truly does matter because then when you get on the court, you guys all trust each other. Like, you guys are more than just teammates, like your brothers. Like, yeah. it's, it's a real family. And I think we, like, we mastered that at Rutgers. Mm-hmm. Like, our class specifically, like, Ron, Caleb, Luke, like, those are my brothers. You yes. know what I mean? Like, the, that's yeah. family. And I, yep. and I think that not every team has that. Mm-hmm. I could easily – as soon as you guys started coming to Reds, that was something that I saw right away. Sure. I was like, these guys just a- absolutely – you know, aside from what they're doing on the court, off the court, I could tell you were just one cohesive unit. Yeah, and, that, I mean, that attributes so much to the success of, you know, how well you guys did over those past few years. Yeah, and, sure. and so, Luke, I feel like, you know, you and Luke were, were coming together all the time. Yeah. You and him – I mean, were you guys just boys right off the rip? Like, how did you guys become so close? <laughs> yo, I'm glad you asked this. So, I got some funny stories. <laughs> He's one of my favorites, yo. Luke I, Nate, absolute legend. Legend. Legend, man. So, I'll tell you. So, so Luke, when he first came to campus, this man didn't talk to anybody. Right? <laughs> so, like, you would think like you would think that we were boys forever, right? Yeah. Like, by the way, we interact now. Yeah. Luke's actually my roommate now in Jersey mm-hmm. City. I live oh, in Jersey dope. City now. And um, you would think that we were boys forever. But when he first came to Rutgers, like, he didn't talk to him anybody so we actually lived in uh the livy towers for the first two weeks of our freshman year which is like this like it's not a, it's not a, it's not a good spot to live yeah. like it ain't, it ain't the best it ain't the best no offense to livy towers but it ain't the best and um we were supposed to move to the livy apartments where it's like luxurious and it's mm-hmm. better whatever only time luke would talk to me was yo do you know we're moving to the, t- to the apartments yo do you know we're moving out the, out the towers like and i'd be like nah bro like i don't know and then that's it. That would be the end of the conversation. <laughs> like, like nothing else. Like he yeah. wouldn't say he wouldn't say anything else. But like he'd be like, "All right, man, damn." Like and then just walk away. And like it was like that for honestly, like two the first two years, like Luke didn't really talk to anybody. And then uh, the COVID year, that's when he got, like started coming out of his shell, started talking to everybody, mm-hmm. and like you know just being more active. He also had like a girlfriend at the time too. Like yeah. the first couple of years, so I okay. think he was always with her and stuff. Like oh, okay, that. But, yeah. You know, like and he really started coming out of his shell, and they were like, "Damn, this dude, funny as hell." Yo, he <laughs> like is had, one of the funniest had, guys. Had one of the no nicest idea. guys, too. I had no idea. And now, yeah. like, you see, him, you see him in Reds. You know, he's going crazy. But yeah. before, like, he'd be, like, in his, in his shell, yeah. like, just in the corner, like, yeah. just chilling. Because you guys were every night together. Like, that was Everybody. the two staple. And yeah. Russ would come. That was, like, the trio. Oh, yeah. That was, like, the big three. You guys Shout would all to come Russ together. Too, Shout yeah. out to Russ, yeah. man. Good yeah. dude. Like, the trio always. And, always. Uh, I mean, it was just – and that was my first experience. So, like, I, off the rip, I see that you guys are all very close. So, and, and I always wondered if right off the bat when you guys got here. It's crazy. Yeah. You would think that. You would really yeah. think that. And I always make fun of it for it all the time. Like, yeah. bro, like, I had no idea. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I had no idea you were this cool, bro. Like, literally, I'm talking, like, two years straight of mm-hmm. not speaking. Yeah. <laughs> like, how do you do that? It's unbelievable. Like, and unbelievable. you're this funny? Like, what? Knowing him now, that's that's hard for me makes, to believe. It makes no sense. That's yeah. funny. And it's that's funny. Cool. We'll tell all the younger guys on the team because they only know the loop now, too. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, bro, he was not always <laughs> like this, <bro>. like, <laughs> <laughs> He was not always like this. That's awesome. Who would, who would you say is was probably one of the one of the funniest guys? I guess I mean, maybe it was Luke, but in the locker room, like on the team. Man. You guys had some characters, some yeah. good dudes. Got some fucking characters. Brooks man. was a funny kid. I, Brooks, Dude, yo, he yo, was hilarious. He's just fun. naturally, you yeah, know. Yeah, he's he's a character. I ain't <laughs> gonna get 
<laughs> I'm not even gonna get in the Yo, dick. Yo, shout bro. out to Nick Brooks. I'm not Absolutely. Even get in the dick, man. But I think I think Caleb McConnell was oh, the funniest man. dude, man. Like and he just cause he got that he's so, like he got that southern accent too. He got that southern like, like yeah. flavor, like where it's just like I'm sometimes I look at him, bro. What are you doing right now? Like, he's I, I love Caleb. Yeah, he's a great no, guy. He's a guy, man. He, he works so hard too. And then I think uh Montez Mathis too, which like people nobody expects this. Like, yeah. Because he'll be dead serious, but, like, mm-hmm. the stuff he'll say, you'll just be like, what? <laughs> yeah, you're not, <laughs> Some funny stuff. Like, but he'll be dead serious, like, looking at you, like, dead. The, and, you know, if you, you've seen him play, like, yeah, straight face, yeah. like, yeah. Oh, like, yeah. hard, like, hardcore. Like, yeah. and he'll be the same way, but, like, it'll just be something funny, but he'll be dead serious. And you're like, bro, like, what is good with you? Like, so I think those two together especially would always mm-hmm. be super funny. Ron, funny as hell. Man. Yeah. Like, Ron right. will just... Whatever's on his mind, he gonna yep. say it. Like he don't care. He's not gonna think yep. about it. Like, <laughs> and just like I mean, you know our team. Yeah, man. like yeah. you could literally go down the line. It's like, bro, we really had some characters. Yeah, like, I, yeah. I wish that we had like a camera crew just going just around, around. Like <laughs> Jacob Young, like character. Yeah. <laughs> like like he was, character. I, I like JY. Like, it was cool. Yeah. The, the way I met JY was, I remember you guys started coming here, and he um, he was just sitting there talking to somebody. And I, I kind of knew who the basketball players were and whatnot. And yeah. and someone was, you know, talking to him or whatever. Because, you know, when you guys come in, everybody likes to talk to you guys. And especially after that season. Right. Um, and so I'm just walking by, walking by, doing my thing. And I'm walking by, and this kid this kid turns around. He goes, yo, Mr. Red, what's up? <laughs> and he was talking to JY. And so JY goes, whoa. He goes, you're Red? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, what's up, brother? I'm JY. I was like, yeah, I know <laughs> you are. Nice to meet you, brother. Yeah, and uh, yeah. we just kind of hit it off there. And uh, he actually went and got me. I was I was talking to him about those uh, Adidas kicks that you guys got that year, yeah. almost like the dunk style Adidas. Yeah. And I was like, man, I saw those, um, and they look so clean. He's like, yo, I'm gonna get you a pair. He was telling me, did bro, he ever get it? Did came he... back that night. Yeah, he's bro, he me. left, and and I was like, oh, we'll see if he ever comes back with him. You know, that's the first time I met him. That night, he comes back yeah, after right. we close. I hear, knock at the door. I'm at the front. Got the shoes for me. I'm he like, told me. I, he did tell me. He was like, yeah, I made sure to get him. Yeah. For that. yeah. yeah. And then he went and transferred, I guess, the following year. Yeah. Where did he go, he Oregon? Did. Yeah, he ended up going to yeah. Oregon. Yeah. yeah but was that was the cool part about our team, though, was just, like, everybody was super personable. Like, yeah, everyone was super genuine, like, actually trying to meet people. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I feel like some, like some athletes, when you get to a certain level, like, they got that ego where it's like they're, like, man, I ain't trying to talk to you. Like, we no. never we never had that vibe on never. our team, which was, like, Perfect. Like, never. Like, I love that. Was like my favorite part about everything was everyone was just super down to earth and genuine. Yes, and you never know. So for me, when I my, my first experience with you guys, like coming here. So first and foremost, this is when I knew that I had made it. Like, and I knew Reds had made it. <laughs> we're you know we're doing the whole year during the COVID. And actually, Sam Johnson, my my good friend, we did a podcast episode uh, that's going to air after this, and we did that last night. We were talking about that whole COVID year. Yeah. And but that year when I knew like. When the, you, people ask, like, when's the moment you know you made it, right? Uh, I'd been following you guys all year, see all the success. You guys are going to the NCAA t- tournament, everything. And then I get a follow on my personal Instagram. And I'm, I, I check it, and it goes, Geo Baker started following you. <laughs> and I went, yo. I forget who was next to me. I went, yo, Geo Baker's following me. <laughs> he just followed me on Instagram. And that's when I knew I made it. And then I think, like, two – Two weeks later was when you guys were going to uh, your first, you know, tournament game. Yeah. And I was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit him up. And I, and I remember the DM I sent. It was the first thing I ever said to you. And I was like, heard the boys are heading out to Indiana today. Right. Light those motherfuckers up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. You were like, let's yeah, go. Like, you were like, let's yes, go. Sir. And you know where we're coming when we get back. Yo. And I was like, let's Yo. go, dude. Yo. It was awesome. But, but going back to what you said, then you guys started coming here after that season ended. Yeah. And it's exactly what you said. The character of the players was is just not even. It's just all a great group of guys like that with no ego that are coming here to be part of whatever is right, going on. Man. Like not no chip on the shoulder when you're in in the building. And always, I remember that year was tough for me because we had the limited capacity. Yeah. So like trying to get everybody in, especially at that time, was when more and more people had heard about Reds because it was right. starting to get warm hours near the end of the year. So everybody had heard about Reds, and now all these new people are coming, and I have all the people that had been coming all year. So I'm trying to manage it properly and make sure that all the people had to be, that had been coming earlier in the year still were able to get in. Right. So then, you know, people were coming, people were coming, and so I was able to kind of manage it through, you know, just my phone, and I'm sitting on the phone all day, and you would always hit me up beforehand. And this is not the case with everybody. A lot of people would just show up right. and expect that I was going to let them in. Right. And I was like, listen, I didn't know you were coming. I have too many people in here right now. 100%. But th- you guys would always hit me up. And you'd be like, hey, how many people can we bring? And what time should we come? Yeah. Is, it, is it even possible tonight? Right. It wasn't even like, oh, we're coming. Like, right. it was like asking. And that's, yeah. 
that was something that I noticed right off the bat because it was different from what everybody else was doing. And you guys are these well-known guys, especially here at Rutgers. And for you to just be doing that, you know, it, that stuck out to me because you weren't, you weren't trying to big league anybody. Yeah, and so that was something that I, I knew right away. And then how you guys conducted yourself when you were in here. I mean, it was just, I could tell that it was just a good group of guys. Yeah, most definitely. And, that, and you know, that, that all goes back to credit to Coach Peichel, too, for, like, finding the right guys to yeah. recruit and, like, understanding that, like, those are the type of guys it took to, like, like change the program, turn the program around, yeah. you know what I mean? And, um, man, that was a great time, though, like, just being able to come here and, like, yeah, we always talked about it, too. We're like, yo, we're going to make sure to hit our bread beforehand yeah. because we knew how hectic it was. Oh. And you got to think about, like, COVID, like, the other bars weren't doing what you were doing. Like, no, like no one was doing what you were doing. No. Like, and you were putting like your name on the line, like yeah. trying to get as many people in here as you could. And like, mm -hmm. so we, we understood all that. And we, you know, we wanted to make sure to like ask beforehand. And like, obviously if it was two pack, like, all right, it's two pack. Yeah. I mean, it's not, yeah. tonight's not the night. Yeah. You know? So but yeah, we always made sure that, you know, just you know, do it the right way. Yeah. That, that was an awesome time. And I, and that was really when I got to know all you guys. So that was really cool for me to, to get to know you guys and see, follow the success. And then the following year, just getting to know you through that, you know, the end of that year and then kind of the beginning of the following year, then getting to watch you guys play. Like, it was, it was just different for me because yeah. I, it was like I knew you guys. Yeah, and then I got definitely. the – luckily, you got those tickets for me for the first opening night. Yes, sir. So I'm at the game watching, and, and it's a totally – when you know the people and, like, you call – like, they're friends of yours and you're watching, it's like a totally different feeling. I bet. Totally I bet. different feeling. I, I can't wait. I'm, I'm going to be at the games now. Yeah, you're going to be going, right? <laughs> so yeah, you got to be excited so to go gotta, watch and cheer them on. Man, I can't wait. Like, yeah. And it's like it's it's a different feeling like than playing and mm -hmm. watching. I don't even know what watching is going to feel like. Yeah. Yet, but I know it's going to be so different, like a different type of nervous, right? Like I'm going to be yeah. nervous as a fan yeah. in, instead of like being nervous as a player. Which That's is, like, what so, it was. I'm like, I'm so like different. nervous. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm like, yo, like I, I, I want you guys to do well. I'm right. like, yo. And, right. and I also remember watching like the NCAA game later that year and I'm, I'm just – I'm sitting in my house and I'm watching and I'm going, I'm just, it's just me and I'm going crazy. I'm yeah. like, oh my, and it was such a back and forth game and I'm just, I was going crazy, yeah, but yeah, it, it really yeah. is. So, but, um, nuts, man. That shit was crazy. but, uh, but yeah, I want to go back to what you said too, because this is something that I wanted to touch on, um, switching topics a little bit is the NIL. Yeah. So it, what, what it seems to me, at least from what I learned about you over the course of that next year is you, you had a major part in, you know, kind of, uh, voicing your opinion and voicing, you know, the disadvantage, I guess, for uh, student athletes when it came to NIL. So I guess, could you just speak on, for people who don't know what the NIL is, yeah. what that is, and then kind of where you stood on it, like what, what made you so passionate about, you know, voicing your concerns about that? Yeah, for sure. So NIL stands for name, image, and likeness, which is basically just, you know, your name, image, and likeness. It's mm -hmm. your rights, right, as a human being. Um, you know, and college athletes actually weren't allowed to, profit off their name image like this so say you did a, a podcast right if you had a podcast and you were a college athlete you were not allowed to make money from that podcast if you had a popular youtube channel you were not allowed to make money from your youtube basketball camps whatever it may be you just were not allowed to make money um whereas if you were you know on full scholarship for music you could drop an album and you could make plenty of money from the album if you were on full scholarship for academics you could be a tutor and have your own tutoring service and you can make money for that so that was kind of where I saw, like, okay, like, what is the difference between, you know, being a college athlete and those two things? Um, and a lot of college athletes were speaking up at the time because also it was, again, the COVID year where, like, the only people who were working were essential workers and, like, athletes, right? Like, mm -hmm. pro athletes and then NCAA athletes who are not getting paid yeah. for, for working, like, in a pandemic. Like, we are literally not allowed to see our family our friends, I didn't go home for Thanksgiving. I didn't go home for Christmas, which is like, okay, right? Like, this is the, yeah. this is the life that I chose. But, yeah. you know, some is just not adding up here that, yeah. that we're not making money. So we ended up starting the movement called the Not NCA Property Movement, just basically just saying that, you know, you, the NCA shouldn't be allowed to own the rights of college athletes. Mm -hmm. um, we ended up meeting with the NCA president. We met with lawmakers. Um, I was wearing, like, a Not NCA Property shirt during uh, the NCA tournament, mm -hmm. which was, like, pretty scary honestly like it was a big statement because you also have to think Rutgers hadn't made the tournament in 30 years yeah so it's like okay now your starting point guard who's like supposed to be your leader is thinking about some other shit like he yeah. not even think about basketball but for me like the I would always talk to the people closest to me and you know they're like listen like this is a lot bigger than just basketball like this is like this is real shit this is real life like this yeah. is, this is gonna change lives if this ever gets passed um and and you know that's kind of that was always my thinking just about that and then also thinking about like past teammates like 
guy like Corey Sanders, I don't you were, I don't think you were here when Corey yeah. Sanders played here, but like this man had like three hundred thousand followers on Instagram, and it's like you know I think about him, you know he he had he had a daughter at the time, right? He ended up leaving school early to go like to take care of his daughter, right? To mm-hmm. go get paid. It's like dude, he could have finished college if if name image and likeness was here. Like he would have finished college because he would have been getting paid yeah. in school, right? So, and and you know and now that's something he doesn't have his degree, right? And and you know he can obviously always come always come back, but you know that's like and that's just one story, right? Think about how many stories there are like yeah. all over the country, like and that's just one. That's just a single story. And it's like man, a lot of student athletes could could like this could change their lives, like mm-hmm. this, like because not everyone's going to the NBA, like everyone thinks they're going to the NBA, like yeah, you, you know you're gonna tell your friends like yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to fucking league, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. they yeah. talking about me, yeah, I'm gonna get drafted, but like the reality is not everybody's gonna do that, and mm-hmm. you know like what is your backup plan or do, or do you have something in place where you're making money? So like. Even it's not even just about the money too, but for me, with name image likeness this, this past year, like I networked a lot. Like I got yeah. a chance to meet a ton of people. Like I got a chance to learn about business deals, negotiating, taxes, investing. Like that's all shit you don't think about when you just when you're just a basketball player. Mm-hmm. It's like now it's not Geo the basketball player. Like it's Geo like the the entrepreneur, the you know the dude with the Alba Fitness clothing or the dude on Cameo. It's like now it's all this bunch of different stuff, and like you get to learn like. Who Gio is as the person. And I mm-hmm. think that that was like the biggest thing for me was like I don't want to be labeled as a basketball player. Like I want to be labeled as, you know, all this different stuff that I do. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. I mean that that you took a real big like leadership role in that as well. Going back to like yeah. being and and it was something that I kind of learned throughout the year. And then after it got passed, I felt like you were somebody who was able to really capitalize on that as well. For sure, for sure. Yeah, it was it was it was great, man. Like just. Again, all the stuff I was just, like, saying, like, I was very strategic about how I would go about deals. So, like, I would never do a deal if I didn't, like, personally fuck with it. Like, if I was like, yo, if I don't if I don't vibe with whatever yeah. it is going on, like, the brand, whatever it is, then, you know, I don't want to do it because I'm trying to build my brand as a person as, as well. It's so, like, most of the stuff I did were all local deals. So, like, again, going back to Alva Fitness, like, they had no other athletes signed, but they were owned by two Rutgers alumni, right? Mm-hmm. So, keeping it in the family – young dude, he's locked in on, like, pushing my stuff out, whereas like, I could have gone with, like, a, a bar stool or a player's trunk where they're nationally known, but they also have, like, 50 to 100 athletes already signed. So it's like, okay, are they really going to focus on me yeah. and my brand? So, like, I was very strategic with that. And then just being personable, like, all of our teammates, all of my teammates were really good at this, like, coming in here and, like, talking to everybody, but I would bring that to, like, Cameo as well. So, like, Cameo is just a video service where – you can pay, you know, your favorite athlete, influencer, or whoever it is to send you, like, a little, like, 30-second, mm-hmm. like, happy birthday or a motivational speech, whatever it is. If they, if they request, like, a 20-second video, I'm doing 50 seconds. If they're requesting yeah. 15, I'm doing 30. Like, mm-hmm. and I'm just going over the top, like, being super personal because, like, number one, it's the right thing to do. Like, why would I not? These are my fans, my supporters. And then number two is, like, they're going to want to come back and, like, ask for another one. Like, so it was, it was good business. You know, they were getting value out of it. Yeah, that was something that I noticed throughout that whole entire year after it passed was that you were somebody who was really able to take uh, advantage of that. And then I, I've seen that you've gone and you've, you've talked about it, you know, multiple, I guess, multiple different conferences and things like that. <coughs> what, what advice would you give to, I guess, a student athlete coming in now that really wants to take advantage of that? Because, uh, like, going back to the skill thing, you had the skill you know, in basketball, and so that made you a well-known player. And then your leadership ability is something that takes you to the level you want to be at. So what advice would you give to any player, I guess, coming in, you know, to a situation like this or, or anywhere across the country, any one of those universities, what could they do kind of off the bat or if they're, you know, in the middle of their career to help yeah. them in that process? Yeah, man, you know, it's, it's funny. You know, the, the advice really isn't that complicated. Um, you know, for me, it was just don't be an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> Nah, for real. Like yeah. it's it's funny because like it's like oh what like what like that's what you just gonna say about yeah. it. but it's like for real like all again going back to my deals like they were all local deals they were all people who were supporting me throughout my college career yeah like for you know just just because just yeah. because they're Rutgers fans and it's like the reason they 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 wanted to do a deal with me is because every time we had an interaction like it was super genuine I was always very nice like I was never an asshole to anybody like mm-hmm. if if someone ever came up to me when like. People will come up to me with, like, their parents on FaceTime. Like, yo, can you just say hi to my yeah. <laughs> And it's, like, it's kind of, like, wild. When yeah. you think about it, it's, like, yo, I got a phone in my face. Like, yeah. yo, I'm just trying to hang out. But, you yeah. know, at the end of the day, it's, like, okay, this is a person who's, like, clearly a huge fan. Like, mm-hmm. why would I not take mm-hmm. 20 seconds out of my day to talk to them on FaceTime yeah. real quick? And that translated into deals. That translated into money. And, like, the way I conducted myself on social media, like, 
don't be an asshole on social media. Yeah. Like, don't don't be tweeting stupid stuff about about drinking, smoking, whatever yeah. it is. Even if you do that in your in your private life, like that's that's fine. But mm -hmm. that's not social media isn't the place for it because no. you got kids looking up to you, you got brands, and you can make money now. Like a lot of people don't realize you can you are a brand. Like you can make money. So don't be tweeting any stupid stuff. Don't be putting any dumb stuff on Instagram. Like. Because you got to be professional now. Yeah. Like, that's, that's just how it is. And there are so many, so many people that are, you know, even, like you said, the kids, they're looking up to you. Like, I see it at the rack. I, after every game, there's kids lined up there. Right. Like, these right. are kids that are young, probably basketball players that are right. like, yo, like, when they get older, they're going to be like, yeah, when I was young and coming to these games, I was watching guys like Geo Baker, Ron Harper Jr. Yeah. Like, those are the guys I saw. Yeah. And then to follow up and be able to see you, like – it makes a total difference if you're somebody who's just kind to somebody like exactly. very simple. That That's exactly. Like, it, and you don't, you don't need a big following for that. Like mm -hmm. I think a lot of people get like NIL twisted where it's like, Oh, I need a hundred thousand followers. And like, uh, I need, you know, foot locker to hit me up and like do mm -hmm. a big deal. It's like, nah, bro. Like yeah. you can literally, like I was getting paid to go to birthday parties. Yeah. Like what? Like it's crazy <laughs> to think that you couldn't do that before. Yeah. Because it's, crazy. it's, it's, I mean, I, the whole thing was they, I guess, you're, you're getting a scholarship, you're getting a, you know, mm -hmm. an education and things like that. But what the school makes off of like games like that, and yeah. is, it's, it's insane. And yeah. so, and you're not even, I mean, a lot of the things that you're getting paid from like that is not even affecting the school. And, and, and I mean, it's doesn't just it, your personal brand. It doesn't affect the school and it has <clears throat> nothing to do with basketball. Yeah. Like it has nothing to do with basketball. There's, there's walk-ons right now who are getting paid money because they built a following on TikTok, right? Or, mm -hmm. Or not even just walk-ons, people who don't play, right? Maybe mm -hmm. they get no minutes. They're not the best player by any means, but, mm -hmm. you know, they make sick dancing videos on TikTok. Yeah. Or, like, or they have, like, a really cool relationship, like, dynamic, and they get a ton mm -hmm. of views on TikTok. And now they're making a ton of money, but before, they weren't even allowed to do that, even though they weren't even playing. Like, they weren't even getting in the game. And it's like, how are you going to restrict someone's ability to make money off of something else that has nothing to do with their sport. Yeah. Like, that's crazy. That yeah. doesn't make any sense to me. As, as soon as it got passed and I saw the way you guys were, you know, making money and able yeah. to capitalize on it, I was like, this just makes sense. Like, yeah, this is not – sure. this should have been something that's been going – that has been going on for a while. And like you said, going back to the Corey Anderson, I mean, he could have been – Totally fine. Could have finished college. I mean, so I think what you guys did in that whole movement was huge sure, for all the future yeah. student athletes. Most so definitely, most definitely. Hope, hopefully when they're, you know, looking back, they can kind of see the, the pioneers of who kind of led the charge back then. Because <laughs> in a couple of years, they're just going to be like, oh, this is just a normal thing. Right. But a lot of people won't know how hard you guys had to fight to do that and what, you know, sure. all the. But I think going off that, then you were talking about how, you know, it's the personal brand and what you're doing and, and how you could just stay local and like, yep. you know, stay within for you. It would be the Rutgers community yep. and that whole, you know, the alumni association and all that stuff. It's it's a deep network. Yep. So you just recently started something with Eric Legrand, yes, sir. Uh, the yes, Knight sir. Society, correct? Yep. Yes, sir. So so this is huge. I mean, this is this is big time. So could you just tell people, I guess, what the Knight Society is and, and kind of what it's going to be doing moving forward here? Yeah. So, I mean, Knight Society literally just goes into like everything that we've just been talking about, right? Like it's all it all revolves around genuine interactions getting a chance to meet your favorite Rutgers athletes, networking, helping each other, supporting each other, supporting local businesses. Like, it's all that into one. That's what we're really trying to to achieve. Like, that is our goal. Night Society is basically just a membership program where if you buy a membership, first off, 75% of the revenue from the membership goes straight to student athletes who we have signed. So right now I think we have 18 student athletes who are, like, promoting our membership program. Those student athletes split the 75% of each membership evenly. So it just goes out to them just for promoting it. That's amazing. Um, and then on top of that, so then we can use that money to pay them to come to meet and greets, right? Maybe a podcast appearance, you know, whatever it may be that like what fans want. Like, like as if what we've been telling our, the fans is like, okay, just let us know what you think is valuable. Like if you think that a meet and greet with Caleb McConnell, like is what you want, then you know, we can make it happen. We're, we're just facilitating it, right? Like, mm -hmm. we can we can make that happen. If you think that him at your kid's birthday party is, is what would be best, like, okay, we can pay him to go to the kid's birthday party. So, yeah. like, that's the cool part about NIL is, like, you decide what's valuable to you as a fan, as, like, as a customer. Like, what, like, what do you want in, re in return for, like, in return for the money? So, I think that's really what we're trying to get at. And then on top of that is, like, networking. Like, I think that Rutgers has a ton of pride, but it's super disconnected. Like, I, I don't – for – Maybe not for me because whatever, whatever has happened in basketball wise, mm -hmm. but like for a regular Rutgers student, if they try to go on LinkedIn or they try to cold email like an, a Rutgers alum, super hard. Like it's super hard to get in, in contact with them. Now mm -hmm. in Night Society, it's like, okay, you see that you're a member of Night Society, I'm a member in Night Society. 
we're both going to these events together. It's like, okay, eventually a conversation is going to start. And we yeah. actually we actually had our first event at Tavern on George, um, you know, just a couple of days ago. And we had Ron Harper there. We had Caleb, Cliff. Yeah. Like, we had Luke Nathan was there. Like, a ton of athletes were there. A couple of uh, soccer girls put up, Megan McClellan, Allie, Allie Lowry. Um, so, like, a good amount of athletes were there. And then, you know, fans are interacting with each other. They're interacting with the athletes. Their kids are coming in, getting stuff signed. It's just, like, a good vibe, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and, and on top of that, we also had, um, you know, a couple of, like, Rutgers students there. So the students are getting a chance to meet alumni, making connections. And then it goes from talking about night society and sports to talking business to talking jobs. Students are, are interacting with, like, wealthy alumni, right? Mm-hmm. And you're going to learn how they, how they atta- obtain that wealth, right, what they did in their business, what they're doing now, are they hiring, right? So it turns into, it goes from genuine conversations to professional conversations, and that's, like, our, our main goal is, like, just connecting the entire community together. Yeah, I, I, why, I, I saw you in an interview recently, um, and you were talking about that disconnect. Yep. And as soon as you said that, I, I totally agreed with that because yep. I could kind of see just getting to know Rutgers throughout the last two years. It's, it's, people are very passionate yep. about the sports and everything, but there, it's lacking that connection yeah so i think you and and teaming up with uh legrand yeah you two leading the charge i don't, I don't think there's a better combo that could Most be definitely. the ones to do that yeah well, i mean when i first when i first like thought of this idea um he was the first person i called right because it just it just makes sense right like he is a he is a Rutgers icon like and he is the guy who can you know really bring everyone together you know what i mean yeah. like he he is that that big time you know mm-hmm. like and, and he's that genuine too like he is a like a a real inspiration to Mm -hmm. me to all student athletes to all the Rutgers fans and it's like okay this is this the guy who I'd want to partner up with to do something like this but um yeah man I think I think it's gonna be really special like obviously I'm a little bit biased but uh, (laughs) you know but I agree but you know I think it's gonna be huge man we've been we've been like seriously grinding even in like and going back to that disconnect it's like if you go to New York City or like Hoboken like you'll find Michigan bars right like you'll Mm -hmm. find you might find like a Wisconsin bar, Ohio State bar. Yep. You don't see any Rutgers bars. And it's yeah. like, that's like, that's pretty, that's pretty fucking weird. Like, yeah. Like, how the hell, like, we're the state school in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. How is there not a Rutgers bar in the in the heart of New York City where you know that when you get there, the Rutgers game is going to be on. Like, the Rutgers yeah. football game is going to be on. The Rutgers basketball game is going to be on. You know that you're going to see other people with that Rutgers block R on their head mm-hmm. or, like, on their shirt or whatever it is. And there really isn't, like, it's not established yet. And I think that that's, like, another thing that we really want to hit on is, like, and we got to build that community presence and, like, knowing as a Rutgers supporter, like, you have that safe space to go to when you're trying to watch a game. You're trying to, you know, in, enjoy, you know, time with other Rutgers supporters. And uh, right now, they're just it's just not there. Like, we're not there yet. Yeah, I think you and LeGron building that over the next couple years is going to be something that turns that network exactly. totally around. 180. 180. And I think it's going to be a really strong connection. And I, 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 how did you end up? Linking up with LeGron. Like, did yeah. you know him through, I guess, playing through Rutgers? Was that, when did you first yeah, meet him? So, and So, uh, he was actually, he was one of the first people to sign me on an NIL deal. So, um, you know, he he paid me just to promote LeGrand Coffee House. That's right. And, um, you know, and, I, and again, like, going back to my brand, like, I love, I love the idea of it because, again, going back to COVID, like, couldn't really see people, right? You couldn't hang out with friends, couldn't hang out with family. And the Grand Coffee House, they, what they were promoting is, like, enjoy a nice cup of coffee with someone that you love, right? So it's like, damn, like, that's, like, really hitting home, yeah. especially during COVID. Yeah, it's yeah. like, okay, like, yeah, this is something that, like, everybody needs. Like, everybody mm-hmm. needs, like, that that messaging in their head. And I love the idea of that. So, of course, I was going to accept it. And, of course, it's Eric LeGrand. Like, yeah. I'm not, not going to say no to Eric LeGrand. So, you know, that's kind of how we first met. And um, I really didn't know too much, like, about his story. Like, I, I, I knew, like, enough, but I didn't know, like, like, all the stuff that he's done. And, like, just, I started, like, looking into it more and, like, man, just like a true inspiration, bro. Like all the stuff that he does. And, you know, we ended up talking a little bit more and then I hit him with this idea. He brought his business partner uh, in on it. And, you know, next thing was history. Like they both loved it, which made me feel a lot better because I was like, yo, I think this is like what Rutgers needs, like what we want. Like this is everything. And, mm-hmm. and they, they were in love with the idea and we just kind of ran with it. That's, I mean, the, the way that connection comes about and then you two, like I said, being the combo that's going to drive that. To me, it's just a win-win. Yeah, it's well, going to be amazing. So I'm excited to see where that goes. Hopefully, we can do an event here. I'm hoping yeah. at one point. I mean, we got a big space, so hopefully, yeah, maybe nah, one of the bigger I've, events. I've been, I've definitely been, I've been checking out this space. I think yeah. we definitely need to do an event <laughs> here, man. For sure, that'd be awesome. That'd, that'd be, be awesome. awesome for sure. Um, 
So going back to, I guess, or actually branching off that, so you start this after you graduate. Yeah. Where it was was playing at the next level something you were thinking about? Or when did you decide? Because this announcement kind of came soon after. So had you decided already? To, because I, I, I was like, okay, if Gio wants to play at the next level, he's going to play at the next level, yeah, like 100%. Sure. But then I saw that you had announced this, and I was like, okay, he's going with this. Is, is this something you – you know, outright chose to do? Like, how did that decision come about? Yeah, so um, so I declared for the NBA draft the year before, during that COVID year. Mm-hmm. Um, got a chance to work out with a couple of teams. Uh, great feedback. Um, you know, I don't I don't think by any means I was going to go get drafted. Like, I'm very realistic, but I think I would have had it. Like, I would have played in summer league. Like, I would have had that shot to do that. 100%. Um, you know, but NIL, what NIL, like, taught me was, like, man, I fell in love with so much different shit, like, like, I really did. Like, and I think I've always kind of known this. Like, I always I always love thinking with my, like, working hard, working my mind hard. Whereas, like, my body, like, I would do it, but I didn't love it the same type of way. Okay. Like, for, for me in basketball, like, the stuff that I always looked forward to the most would be, like, strategizing plays or, like, you know, who can I get open on this one? How can we get an easy bucket? How can we save a bucket? Uh, the other team's plays, do I know it? Like, it's a lot of mental stuff. Whereas, like, I didn't love lifting. Like, I didn't love conditioning, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> like I did it because I, I had a goal. Like, I had a goal that I wanted yeah. to achieve, so I would do it. But, like, I didn't love it. Like, and I think that NIL taught me even more. It was like, damn, like, negotiating deals is fun. Like, business is fun. Trying to connect everybody is fun. Like, this is what, like, I really want to do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if I go play pro, realistically, I'm probably going to end up overseas somewhere. It's going to be – my body's fucked up already. Yeah. Like, I played five years in college. I was playing, like, 35 minutes a game all five years. Like, my shit's fucked up. Right. Like, <laughs> like, both my ankles, like, they be cracking. Like, yeah, like no, everything, no. like, uh, As you say everything, it. everything's yeah. messed up. So, like, realistically, I got, like, three good years left in me playing overseas. So, do – and after that, I would probably try to do what I'm doing now. So, why would I not do it right now when my name is still hot and, like, mm-hmm. you know, it just makes more sense. Yeah. So, I think that was kind of, like, what it came down to and – you know, definitely thought it through, like, for a good amount of time because, like, obviously growing up as a basketball player, like, your, your number one goal is to make the NBA. Like, and I had that, that shit right in front of me. Like, mm-hmm. teams are calling about me, like, mm-hmm. to get workouts. Uh, not the combine, but there's, like, the combine, then there's the, um, like, then there's, like, the senior combine, which is, mm-hmm. like, so that's, like, the second level. I got invited to that, mm-hmm. uh, and I, like, turned it, I turned it down. I was like, yeah. I, I don't think I'm going to go. Like, I, I think I'm going to do this instead. And, and, like, a lot of people were, like, looking at me crazy. And it's like, that's what I want to do. Like, this is, like, it sounds fun to me. It sounds exciting. It's a new challenge. And, um, you know, just weighing all those different options, man, like, it's what I came to. And, uh, honestly, like, I don't, I don't regret it. Like, I'm, I'm, I've been having a great time so far, like, enjoying it. Obviously, there's there's challenges all the time. Trying to run a company is fucking crazy. Yeah, <laughs> like trying to do. Oh, this, believe I'm sure me, you know. Oh, yeah, I'm sure running you know. a business so, like, is tough. You know, there's obviously challenges with it, but like I've always been the type of person like I love that shit. Like I've started at ground zero, like all over again. I could have easily stayed like with basketball where I'm already mm-hmm. at a high level, but it's like mm-hmm. nah. Like I, I kind of like the idea of like starting over and trying to figure this shit out. I think that's huge for for anybody listening. Like just thinking about because you're someone who plays at. The high, what I think the highest level of somebody who could play, you know, at, at, I mean, you're in the Big Ten, you're dominating, your skill is at the top. You definitely had teams knocking, and that opportunity was right there. Sure. But it wasn't something that was, you know, really in your heart at that time. Right. And so following that, I'm, it, it's kind of funny. It's making me think about when, you know, I opened this place with my family. You know, I, was, I, I had worked in the family business for, you know, some time all growing up, and I had worked in other restaurants as well. And then, you know, I wasn't working in it after college. I had been doing other things and and taking other opportunities. And then my, you know, my dad, my uncle, my uncle Frank, they, they were thinking about opening another location. Mm. And, you know, they, they had asked me, they said, do you want to get in on this? And do you want to run this place? And I, and I was weighing the options. And at that time I was kind of thinking about doing something else aside from what I was doing at the time. And I was like, man, I can't miss this opportunity. This is what I've always, this is like, you know, so for anybody that doesn't know, Red Red is my nickname because of my red hair, which I used to have a lot more. But this business has slowly been pushing it back. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, but my grandpa was the original Red. Okay. Cool. So he, you know, he was the original okay. Mr. Red. And so that's where the name came from. Um, and so he was like my hero. 
Yeah. My grandpa. He knew everyone. Every, anywhere he went, they'd be like, yo, Red, Red, Red. And then we'd always ask him, we'd be like, who is that? Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't no know. Idea. Yeah. But he, he knew, but he didn't know, who, like, he didn't know, know her name, yeah. like, he, you know, because he knew so many people. Right. And, like, I saw that growing up, and he was just always, like, well, like you said, when you walk in the door, it's like life, life of the party. Like, yeah. as soon as you walk in, you can control the room. Yeah. And he was like that. Wherever he went, it was just, it didn't matter who was in the room. Right. He was, he was the guy. And so I grew up looking, looking up to him. And so the opportunity presented itself, uh, or the opportunity presented itself to do this. And I was like, man, like I've always wanted to be like him. I've always right. wanted to be him. So I'm going to take this and run with it and see what happens. Yeah. I think, I think there's not enough people, you know, are taking risks. Like, yeah. Like, like realistically what I try to do, trying to do right now is a risk. What you did was a risk. Like you said, mm-hmm. you already had something that you were playing. Like you had yep. a plan and you're like, man, fuck it. Like I'm going like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And I think that people don't, like, I think social media got a lot of people messed up too. Oh. Because you see all this stuff on social media. It always looks like everybody has it all together. Mm-hmm. But like, man, the more I'm in these business meetings and the more I'm meeting some of these people and it's like, man, this is like a, they've achieved a lot in life and they still don't got it all together. Oh and it's man. Like, this dude don't got it all together. And like, Oh, what, what's going on with them? And it's like, man, you know, I'm good. I'm only 24 and, and I don't, I don't have it all together obviously. And nobody does. And, and it's like, that's fine. Like still go for it. Take that risk. Like, because, it's better to take that risk than do something that you, that you don't love. Right? Oh and, man! And, and, and in the back of your mind, knowing that you could have, you know, could have tried something new that that you do love and you didn't do it. Like that, man. No, nobody should go through that. Like you should yeah. always just, man, just go after. There's people right now making money from TikTok. Like, oh, and it's and, unbelievable. And like, and you're doing shit that you don't love. Like, yeah. What the fuck, like, take, dude? <laughs> any anybody who's out there watching, I mean, take just. I hope they realize hearing that from you. I right. mean, that is just the truth. If you're trying to do something or if you're doing something that you don't love oh, maybe and and it's different for everybody because some people have a lot of responsibility and so maybe they have to do something they're right. doing right now but if you're not at least trying to get to a place where you're yeah. going to be doing something that you truly love that you want to do it's not going to be easy because you're always going to grind and even when you get to the point of doing something you love like I love running this place this right. is amazing like opening this place with my my family has been one of the greatest experiences i could ask for the people i've got to meet become friends with all the opportunity that has presented itself because of it right it's it's been i i, I would never trade it for the world but there's always going to be tough times as well I and understand. it's you just have to realize that you're going to have to push through it but if you're what would what will keep you going is knowing that you're working towards doing something you really want to do. Exactly. And if you could feel that inside, like you said, you're like, it was in my heart. Like, this is what I felt was calling me. This is what I felt like I wanted to do. It's exactly where you will want to be when you go through all that shit that you got to eat exactly. and get to the other side. Exactly, man. Yeah, and I, yeah, man, I, I 100% agree. Like, I just, I just don't think, like, even, and you said it too, like, having a responsibility, like, okay, that's 100% understandable, but, it could always start as a side hustle. Right? Yeah, like you could you could handle business at your nine to five, and if that's not what you want to do, and p- some people love nine to five, I'm yeah. not knocking a nine to five, hundred percent at all. Like some people love that shit, but if you don't, like man, find that find that little window to start that side hustle and mm-hmm. build that side hustle up until eventually that can become your main thing. And it's like okay, now you can you still responsible because now you're making money from this thing and you can just switch it. Mm-hmm. So I think a, like a, just a lot of people just don't want to take that risk, and you know they kind of stay in that little bubble even though they don't really love what what it is that they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, and like you said, the social media thing, like everybody's seeing what's going on. But right. you know what I, I, I learned is that, that that is very true. And it's the same in, in, in real life, too, outside of social. Like people only know or really think they know what they see. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people, are, you know, they come up to me all the time. They're like, yo, Red, like you're loaded. You got all this money. This place is packed <laughs> all the time. I'm like, dude, I'm like, have you not been realizing what's going on the past couple of years like we were just closed we the we were just closed for six months before we opened last year we right. operated at literally 25 percent capacity 50 percent capacity like 75 percent capacity for a whole nother almost year before they opened everything up and we had just opened up the year before that so you are it's not like you're making money right i mean it's people are only seeing or knowing what they see yeah. and it's not always the case and i think a lot of people are on the other side and, and think they're seeing somebody who's so successful and things like that. And it's, it's just not always the case. It's, yeah, it's, sure. it's, it's something that's kind of under the rug that they don't get to see. They only see kind of all the benefits of it exactly. and they don't understand really what's, what's lying underneath and how much work you actually have to do and what you're going through, you know? Right. So it's, it's cool to hear that from somebody like you who, who literally played, had that skill and played at the highest level. And then people can listen and say, you know, even him playing at that level, like it was something else inside of him that he wanted to do. Yeah, most definitely. And I think you just got to chase it. Like, 
Absolutely. Nobody has it all together, man. Like, I think that's the biggest message from it all is, like, yeah, you know, no, nobody has it all together. So, yep. you know, chase, chase what it is that Go you Go for love, it. Right? Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Damn, that was real. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was good. That, that, that's getting clipped yeah, all I, day right yeah, there. I don't, even, I don't um, think we're going to get in. No, that, that, that's yeah. fire. Um, <laughs> all right, so, so going back to, the, you know, you playing, was there – what was your, your favorite team to play against and least favorite team to play against? Do you have one? Because I know when, when I played baseball in college, a lot of people don't know that. But um, and I was pretty good. But my favorite teams to play against were sometimes the teams where I would go and I'd hear the most chirping. Yeah. I, and, and also they were the teams that were probably some of the best teams in the league. But that's because they played at a high level. And I always right. wanted to play at a high level. And I knew going into the game I could actually compete in almost like a chess match. Right. Like in baseball, it's very much like it's, it's so mental. And so some of my, my favorite teams to play against were the ones you would think are not. Because right. you're getting chirped and everybody's That's talking right. all this shit and you suck and all this from the, but I love that it kind of yeah. gets me and and you're someone who was able to, I guess take the pressure of that and just excel your game. So I guess who who, well I, I want to know how you kind of dealt with that pressure and were able to use it to your advantage. But who was your like your favorite team and least favorite teams to play against? Yeah, I think my I mean favorite team is you know you got to say Cian Hall. Um, oh my God! So, yes, absolutely. So, I, so I'll say Seton Hall. Then I'll also give you like a favorite conference team too. But Seton mm -hmm. Hall, like, you know that that environment when you like, it's like real hate. Like it's it's hate. It's you real I mean? hate. And it's like, and I'm not even I'm not even from Jersey. Like, right? I'm from yeah. New Hampshire. And but as soon as you get on that court, like you feel it. Like it's you feel the tension. Like it really is like true hatred. Like, mm -hmm. and I and I know some of those guys. Like I'm cool with Miles Powell. I'm cool with Jerry Roden. But yeah. you know on that. That day on that game day, like, nah, you you have no friends on that other side, and and like that, that's fun, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like you're like, yeah, like this is like a real, like it really felt like a battle. Like, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, like, absolutely. Obviously, I don't know nothing about war. I don't know nothing about that, but like, it felt like a battle. <laughs> like, like man, we got we got kill these motherfuckers. Like, uh, <laughs> that's uh, yeah, we, that's just how we feel. And um, you know that environment, man, especially at the rack. Like, honestly, the, the Prudential Center. Not not that lit. The the rack the rack though. Like, oh man. man, it was it was crazy. Like it was. And, and my freshman year, we beat them, and that was we sucked. <laughs> like, my <laughs> freshman year, we sucked. We weren't good. We weren't good. They were top fifteen in the country, and we beat them, man. Like I remember, they stormed the court, and before the game, Angel Delgado was like, "As long as this," is, he was the senior captain for Senior Hall, and he was like, "Man, as long as I, I'm at Senior Hall, we'll never lose to Rutgers." Coach Pico had that shit on the oh. whiteboard, the folding board. He had that shit on the court. He was like, hey, "This motherfucker said no. that we're never gonna beat him." Blah blah blah. Man. We came in there, man. We grinded out a W, like grinded, and they yeah. were good. Like th I'm talking top fifteen team mm -hmm. in the country. Like mm -hmm. they were really, really fucking good. And you know, just that feeling of like, yeah, we just talk shit. Like yeah. we run Jersey, like. Kind of what you were just talking about. Like, you would think that, you know, some people would shy away from something like mm -hmm. that. Like, some mm -hmm. people just aren't, you know, they don't want that competition. But, like, for us, like, it's, like, it's just so fun. And then, you know, I think in conference, honestly, my favorite team is a little bit different was Indiana because mm -hmm. I just knew we were going to kill them. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I just knew, like, and, and, and the, the, the good part about it, it does go back to trash talking a little bit, was, like, Indiana fans are so entitled because – you know they have all these national championships when there were yeah when there was like dinosaurs History. walking around and and shit like <laughs> like it's okay bro like no one was born yet when that happened none yeah. of you guys were born but you know they love to flaunt it right and then they all look at Rutgers as like the doormat and you know they would you know whatever buck they would call us buckers you yeah. know whatever like like whatever it was ruggers like they yeah. would like straight disrespectful mm -hmm. so like. And I would, I used to, I'm, I'm weird, man. Like, I used to be on Twitter, like, I would, I would find it all. Like, I would find, yeah. <laughs> I would find the, the, the Indiana fan page that had, like, two followers and, like, they're, they're tweeting out an article and it's, like, some sloppy work. It's, like, on a Google Doc and I'm yeah. looking at it and it's, like, yeah, Rucker sucks. And it's, like, oh, okay, bad, bad, bad. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then we, go, we go there, beat them by 20. Like, yeah, fuck, like, fuck Yeah. Man. So, like, <laughs> that was, that was my favorite team to play against because I knew we were going to beat them. Like, I, every year I knew we were better than Indiana. And then, like, I also knew, like, we get to, like, Talk a little like we wouldn't even talk trash, but we like we would talk trash with our game. Like we, yeah, like they couldn't say shit. Yeah, they can't like, say when shit. When Ron hit that shot this year, man, unbelievable. Them, if you saw the faces in the crowd, how mm -hmm. mad they were that Ron hit that shot. Yeah, and they couldn't do anything about it because the game was over. Mm -hmm. Like that feeling was just special, man. And then a team I hated playing against, uh, probably got two. Both of them from Michigan, Michigan and Michigan State. 
Um, the main reason why is because Michigan State had a point guard, Cassius Winston, who like, again, like I'm, I'm weird. Like I'm, I'm watching film. I'm trying to figure out like I'm, I'm strategic. I'm trying to figure out every possible way to beat Michigan State because we we hadn't beaten them until the COVID year. So we had mm-hmm. Rutgers had, in history had never beaten Michigan State. Really? Yeah, never. Same thing with Michigan. Same thing with Michigan. Um, never beat Michigan State. So I'm trying to figure out, man, how the hell do I beat this dude? And like every time, could not figure it out. Like. Mm-hmm. This dude, I never beat, I never beat Cassius Winston. Like, to this day, that shit still pisses me off. Like, what, <laughs> like, how the fuck I not figure this shit out? And um, we ended up being them when he left. So, like, he yeah. was a year older. So, I was like, all right, yeah. that's fine. But, like, oh, but yeah. it still, it still weighs on you. Like, man, so I hated playing against Michigan State, but I think it was really just, I hated playing, playing against Cassius Winston. Mm-hmm. And then, same thing with Michigan. We can never figure out a way to beat Michigan. They always had, like, really good offense. Like, I think they were just really our kryptonite. And then this past year, we ended up being them for the for the first time. Like our first time being them was at home this year, and I had twenty seven points in that game. Mm-hmm. So like, that was a really good feeling for me because it's like I could never get over that that hump. Yeah. Of like, man, I want to beat Michigan. Especially Michigan was my favorite team growing up. So really? Like, oh, man, yeah. So it's yeah. like, damn, I can't even beat these dudes. Yeah. And like going back to like, no one recruited me. Like I want to, like I want to beat these dudes. Let them know, like you should have recruited me. Like you were my favorite team yeah. growing up. Like, yeah. Man, so we eventually did that, but those are two teams that like I hated playing against just because we could, I could never like strategically figure out a way to like like out their point guards, you know, like beat their point guards. Was that during the run? Because you had a run where you guys won like eight or ten in a row. Yeah. So um, this past season, this past season, yeah, we beat five ranked teams in a row. Yeah, um, that was a crazy run. I don't think Michigan was part of that run. I think Michigan mm-hmm. was earlier in the season, mm-hmm. um, or maybe they were. I don't even remember. I'm not gonna lie, but. But that run was – That wild. run was crazy because that was – so I was just thinking, like, you know, the whole COVID thing lagged and went on, you know. It, it kind of carried into the next year a little bit. Yeah. And it still wasn't like oh. – so then all of a sudden it's kind of creeping back up when it gets cold. Yeah. In this next year. And I'm like, damn, like, I thought we were past this and everything. Right. And – I remember texting you, and I was like, yo, like, I saw that they had canceled some games. Yeah. And I was like, yo, like, just thinking from my perspective, I'm like, damn, if I was playing, I wouldn't want them to do Like, I want to play. Right. And I was like, yo, I was like, you know, a bunch of bullshit. They canceled it, blah, blah, and then you, And then you kind of flipped it, and you were like, you know what? I think it's kind of good because we could use a little breather. I remember, <laughs> I remember you weren't even uh, 100% healthy at that yo, time. Yo. And so I wasn't even thinking it from that perspective, right? So you text me that. I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe it could be good. Dude. And as soon as that break ended was when that run took we off. And I was crazy. like, yo, he was right. I was yeah. like, yo, you guys came back healthy, whole yeah. squad, and just turned. I mean, that run was insane. Yeah, so at the time, I had, I had like, strained my hamstring or some. I don't even know. Yo, this yeah, you were I, out this, for a few games. This is when I knew I was old. <laughs> this, is when I knew, <laughs> this is when I knew I was old. Listen to how I hurt my hamstring. Though. This is really crazy. I don't even think I've ever said this, like, like on air anywhere. So Exclusive. We're, we're, playing, we're playing against Lafayette, which is the game that we oh, you want to talk about that mm-hmm. game. So we lose that game. But we're playing against them. I'm in a defensive stance, and, like, my hamstring just feels tight. So I'm, And this is, in the, this is the second half. Like, I should be warm by now. Like, there's no reason I should be tight. And I just go to, like, stretch it a little bit. Like, I just extend it, and, like, I just hear a pop. Oh, like stretching, like literally just stretching, big ass pop, and I'm trying to run it off, like oh whatever. And I'm like, yo, I can't run, like, and I gotta go off. I ended up missing like a ton of time. I ended up they give me a shot in my hamstring, like it's like the the PRP or whatever it is, and like they like take blood from like your arm and like infuse it. <laughs> like, I don't know what they do. Yo, they do like some, some crazy, crazy shit. shit. Yo, it was crazy. Mean, I remember man. seeing it like they're like spinning the blood like mad fast so it like Whoa. turns into this like new thing and like and they put that blood into your leg and it's like supposed to like heal it like, uh-huh. like more like red blood cells or something yeah. like something yeah. like that. Or, some like, crazy shit. Some crazy yeah. shit. But um, but it makes your leg hurt even more like when, when they first do it because like it's like a f- big ass needle they gotta like move it around. It's, it's fucked up. It's fucked yeah. up. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and like so I needed the time off like really badly. Like I was not ready to play at all. Um, and then I got the flu. A couple of guys got the flu. Like, so our team was like really banged up. And like, I, that's so like, yeah, when you hit me, like, I was probably one the probably the reason I said it was because I was fucked. Yeah, <laughs> like, you're probably like, I was nah, like, yo, yeah. nah, we good. <laughs> <laughs> like, nah, we, we need that time for sure. <laughs> like, yo. So, yeah, for sure. I, I mean, that, that definitely helped us like a lot. Like, mm-hmm. Probably more than than we realized at the yeah. time too. Yeah, sometimes those things are just blessing in disguise. You don't yeah. know. And I, and like I said, I'm just coming from the perspective I didn't even think about. But like I'm just like, man, if that was me, like I thought we were past this, I'd want to play and like end up being a blessing. You guys go on that crazy run. I mean, yeah. it was it was crazy to yeah. watch all that. And during that time too, we all got we all got a ton of reps up. Like because mm-hmm. no one was playing games, so we we're like, <clears> like we all got in the gym. Like we were getting up hundreds of shots a day. Which like during the season, like you do that in the off season, but mm-hmm. during the season, you never really get a chance to yeah. do that because you're so tired and like you have three hour practices, film, lift, 
you know, you, you don't have a lot of time to get a bunch class. of extra shots up. Yeah, clap. Yeah, literally clap. Yeah. I'm not even thinking of school. So, you know, all that combined, you never get time to, like, actually, like, go get some reps up and, like, work mm-hmm. on your game. So we got a chance to do that, too, during that little break, which was good. Yeah, that must have been huge. That must have really helped kind of glue things together or bring things together. Most definitely, man. Just getting in the gym with each other and getting some shots up. And, like, and we were shooting pretty bad before that, too, so, like, getting all those shots out, like, out your yeah. system and just, you know, just getting back to the grind for a quick second, like, really, I think it just – Shit that everyone's mental, which mm-hmm. is really good. Yeah. I, oh, man, I wish we played Seton Hall during that run. Listen, let me tell you something about Seton Hall. Let me tell you something going back to this. When you said that and I freaked out, because, because. So, by the way, the other Reds is right next to Prudential Center. Yeah, yeah. My dad yeah, runs that one, yeah, right? Yeah. So, it's Seton Hall, home turf. Four games before we had opened this one, I would work there, and I'd close that spot when right. I would be getting ready, you know, and and, and so – you know, it was Seton Hall's territory. And right. so they would come before, ge- before the games, after the games, all the fans. And so that's, you know, Seton Hall bar. And I had not been back for a Seton Hall game since we opened this one. Yeah. And now I'm all Rutgers. Right. First and foremost, I'm friends with all you guys now. 100%. Like, I know 100%. you guys personally. And so I remember I, uh, I, as soon as I saw that, that game coming up, I texted my dad and my uncle. And because we have the connects at Prudential Center to help get us tickets. And I was like, can you get me a couple of tickets to this game? This is a huge game. Obviously, Rutgers Seton Hall is one yeah. of the biggest one of the biggest games of the year. Right. And so I go, I we get tickets to the game. I go with a couple of guys and never been on the other side of it. I've always been there when, it, you know, I'm, I'm Seton Hall, but now just full on Rutgers yeah. and I'm rooting for you guys. So we we go in and no, no issues before the game or whatever. It's, you know, we're all at Reds. We go to Reds to see my dad, see everybody over there, and we're just hanging out. And then we go into the game, and, man, the tickets, good tickets, but they put us right in the mix with all Seton Hall. Like, oh, we were sure. on the Seton yeah, Hall side. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm just – so we get in there, and there's no problem with us. It's me and three other guys. And uh, it's Talon, Brant, and McBeth. Shout out to all of them. They all came for the game. Uh, you know Justin, obviously yeah, he had uh, help with Alva Fitness and all that. Yeah, I remember. most definitely. Um, so we're sitting down and we're right in the heart of these Seton Hall fans. And as soon as we move in, this guy turns around, and these are all older fans, like Seton Hall, like you know, they're older, older yeah, fans. Yeah. Like their alumni network's huge. And he just goes, "Oh man!" Like right off the bat, as soon as yeah. we, and we're like, we're not even trying to cause problems. We're just trying to go watch, see what happens. You know, we're not there to talk shit. We're just right. we know where we are. We're in the midst of all the season, so all. we're not looking for a problem. But if you're looking for a problem, we have no problem <laughs> dealing with the problem. Does so, so these guys are chirping, 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 and we are. This was. It was a back and forth game for a while, and then Seton Hall had that nice run, yeah, and they went did. on like a 15-0 run or whatever. Sure. And we call you, uh, we call the timeout, break their momentum, and these guys just turn around and they're saying all this bullshit or whatever. And so finally, like we, you know, I didn't say anything. I'm like, uh, yeah, I'll see you at the bar after the game. You're probably gonna go to Reds. So right. I'm, not, I'm not gonna say nothing, but I'm gonna remember what you fucking look like. I guarantee <laughs> you. And uh, and this guy starts chirping us, and he and he says something to us just out of the blue, when, and it's totally unprovoked because we're not saying anything because we you they had just got on that run, so there's right. nothing for us to say. We're just sitting in silence, and they just turn around, and start chirping. So <laughs> my buddy Brant looks at the guy. He he said something real foul to us and yeah. out of pocket, and so he goes he goes yeah. He goes, I got your daughter in my back pocket. Yo. <laughs> this guy goes, what'd you say? That's crazy. He goes, I got your daughter in my back pocket. This guy turns around fully and just thought, you don't say nothing about my family. Don't you ever fucking say this. This is an old guy. Yeah. You know, he's with his wife or whatever. And, yeah. and I'm just sitting there like, oh, God. And then, you know. They weren't going to take no shit, so they went back and, right. like, they, we, Talon was just like, yo, sit the fuck down before you get rocked, buddy. Right. I don't care how old you are. I will rock you, dog. Right. Like, <laughs> and so, dude, so I'm sitting in the midst. I'm watching all this. It's, it's so funny, and I'll never forget that line, but Justin's there filming, you know, right. and the people behind us are like, damn, we thought we were about to take out the phones, oh, get the viral yeah, TikTok. Yeah. We thought, because it was I right around the time, <laughs> whatever that was on Barstool, where the guy was, uh, who was a Sons and Six or whatever, Sons, you know, that yeah, 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 it was that very was close crazy. to that, so they were like, right. oh, we thought another one was going to happen, because right. Um, but so then the rest of the game, after they had realized that we were like, that who we were sitting with, were not going to take any shit. They didn't say nothing the rest of the game. Yeah. They all just shut up. Stay your ground, man. Yeah. And after that, it was a very back and forth game. They never went on a run like that again. So, you know, but, um, but it was just what you were saying about seeing all like 
I never been on that side and got to experience it, but we had, you know, we had, I had, I had your custom jersey on from Alpha oh, Fitness, shit, the New Jersey love, says red right on the back, dog, love, yeah, love, and yeah. like that's how they knew right away. I had the red fitted on. They're like, damn, these are Rutgers right, guys. So, right. but that when as soon as you said the scene hall, I was just like, yeah, yeah. now I know. So it's now it's and then energy. I remember sitting at you know one of the holidays at at uh, you know at my grandma's house. We're all having family dinner and we're talking about it. And you know, oh, we got a, we got a Seton Hall game tomorrow, and it's it's my whole family. I'm just like I just I slammed the the table and I was yes. like, yo, I was like, forget those motherfuckers. Like, <laughs> right. yeah. And my dad's like, what? Like yeah, I'm like, yeah, man. I'm like those motherfuckers talking unprovoked. And my <laughs> not like that because my grandma right. would not right. accept all the cursing at the dinner table. Right. But she goes, well, if you say it, I believe it. I said, yeah, you're right, <laughs> right. Those yeah. bastards. You know, but it's it's all in good fun. But you know, of course, sometimes of course, it gets out of hand. It's, so. it's just good competition. That was just, but again, going back to like knowing you guys and like it was like personal touch. You talking Definitely. shit about them, like you, you know, that that those are our guys, fam, you know. Man. That's fam, fam you know. Our you ain't fam. gonna say that. So, but uh, that's awesome. Yeah, all the bragging rights in New Jersey for that. The greatest state in the union. You got Rutgers and you got Seton Hall. So it's a massive game, that's massive cool. game. That's awesome. Have you ever? I guess you have. Have you ever been to any of the other Reds? Not yet. No. Uh, I almost went one time. I remember you invited me one time. I went to a New Jersey Devils game. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, but it was like a, I think it was like a Monday or a Sunday. Yeah, or something, it was, and it was like yeah. it was like eleven thirty. I'm like, yeah, I'm not gonna lie, right? I'm not going. I'm not going on a, <laughs> on a Monday night. Like I'm gonna head home. But yeah, yeah. That was the one time that I almost went to to the other one. But yeah, I saw on somebody's story that you guys were at the game. So I was yeah. like, yo, go if you want to get something, go go grab it. And uh, yeah, that's a cool spot. That's a cool yeah, spot. Man. But I, I'm really happy that I've I've ended up getting to know like so many people from Rutgers here and and do all this because because it's led to so many fun fun times. Like we, Sam and I were talking about Miami. That year, yeah. the, the the COVID year, like yeah. I, I got to go down there and do that. Then when we got back, it was just a different different ball game when we got here. So, um, speaking of, how about when we we got to talk about when we were a headliner Memorial Day weekend? <laughs> I mean, people don't know about this. We we were trying to line up a send that whole summer, never happened. <laughs> the following summer, because we we were gonna go to DJs. Yeah, so everybody knows yeah. DJs my spot. Yeah, I know that. DJs I know. is my spot. I love that place. Love all those everybody who works there. You know. They're all good people, too, which is yeah, why I really like sure. going there. But sure. um, uh, Cisneros, who had DJed here, who's a very good friend of mine, was opening up for uh, A-Craze. And so we uh, we went and we got, uh, you know, the table behind the DJ booth and everything. Did the whole thing because Cisneros was playing, so I wanted right. to support him. And, of course, you know, I live down there, so, you're, you know, headliner's not too far. And so... You know, I don't, I don't do the whole table thing too much. Well, so like, I don't I don't, you, you didn't even end up at the table, did you? No. So, uh, you know, I like to bounce around. I, I'm, in, I'm a trenches guy, which is, again, yeah. with DJs, it's all trenches. You yeah. know, like you're in there and you're just in the yeah. heart of it. So I love that. I love the, the energy. Um, so, you know, I bounce back and forth from the tables. And, you know, I was walking around and I, I'm looping around the corner. And I know, I know DQ's working, the bartender that yeah. we had been yeah. with. And he's a good friend of mine as well. And so I was going to his bar. And as I'm circling up, Who's there, Russ? Yeah. And he goes, yo. And he grabbed I went, no. And then I turned to the right. There's Gio, yeah. baby. I'm like, yo, let's go. So <laughs> finally it lined up. I loop around. We get, we get there. We're all saying what's good. Then we start just running it, just classic. Oh, I mean, man. just classic. Like, we're going <laughs> shot after shot. We're just rolling 20, just going. And, I mean, that was just too much fun. Man, you were you were lit that night, man. Yo. <laughs> you had me, you had me lit. There's no other way to go. I took. A, I, I remember I posted a picture of us um, on Instagram. Yeah, that great day. pic. And my my mom calls me. And she goes, she goes, yo, you know, you look a little drunk. <laughs> I was like, damn. A lot of shots, a lot of white tea like, going. Around, I do. Baby. I was like, I didn't think yeah. I did, mom. No, she's like. We, she was like, that's, she's like, yeah, just be, just be a little. And that goes back to your brand. <laughs> Yo, there you like, go. Yeah, she's yeah, like, just yeah, be a little. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, yeah, you're Meanwhile, right. my brand, I'm like, right. party got, you know. Right. Right. And, I'm having, and I'm having a great time, too, because it's like, mom, I just, you know, I just finished oh. playing. Like, I'm done. Like, I'm retired. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go out. I'm that like, send, you know that send but, was a long time in the making. Man, that, man, that was, that was a good night, though. And I just remember every time you would pull to the bar and you would, and you would just, you were buying shots, shots. And, like, every time you would do it, all of a sudden a crowd would just come out of nowhere behind you. And then, like, you already knew it was coming. You wouldn't oh, even look back. Yeah. You wouldn't even look back. You would get – You would get, I don't even remember how many shots you were buying at a time. It was, like, 50. Like, you were really <laughs> wild. Like, no, literally, yo, I'm telling you, it was, yeah. like, 50. I think oh, I had yeah. a video somewhere in my yeah. phone. Oh, yeah. It was, like, 50 every time. And, like, and it was just all these shots. And you didn't even – you knew that there was people behind you because you would just grab them and you just instantly just – Just <laughs> turn around, not even yo, looking. Just go ahead, oh pass them out until we got one left like, for me. Yeah, sure, man. I, that well, was, you know, was you know it was – Talking about that, like standing in that corner with you, every a lot of a lot of Rutgers kids are going and people that know what's going on, like they go to headliner, they go to DJs, go right. to bar A. When I walk around bar A, it's very tough to like 
move without having you know having to say hello to somebody yeah, and it's, sure. it's amazing i love it and it's the same with you like yeah. so we're sitting in that corner i felt like every single person that was walking like by was just like either geo or red geo yeah, red geo yeah, red people were, you know taking pictures and stuff i mean it was so much fun um and you know again when when i go up to the bar i think a lot of people have known that was already a summer into like getting right. to connect with everybody so they know that we're going to be ordering a lot of shit because you got to have one for everybody you know yeah, like i'm not trying to keep anybody out of it so i'm just uh, and, it, and know, uh that's just the vibe too like, and, and i had run into uh amanda right before that so yeah. i was i was walking there actually i remember i'd been with you guys and then i go back to the table and then i'm walking back i was like yo i'm, I'm gonna be right back so then I run into Amanda, who's part of the squad that you guys had sent with Heavy for a while. Like, that was, yeah, like, the coolest squad, because Luke and Callie. Yep. And they're all friends. Yep. So then I see her. I hadn't seen her yet that summer. I mean, it was Memorial Day weekend, so I hadn't seen her in a while. And so, you know, she was somebody, like, that crew that I had gone out with all the time the summer before. So it was, like, as soon as I saw her, I was like, let's go. And she had a crew with her. She had her sisters. She had all the girls. So I was like, yo, come on. Gio's over there. I'm going to see him. We're going to get shots. We loop back around. And as soon as we got there, it just turned into, you know, 40 people. 40 that people. All, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it was, it was just a lot like of people just running for it and having so <laughs> like, much fun. Yeah, oh, it was so much man. fun. It was a great time. Oh, it was a blast. Sure. It was a blast. So that was Definitely. well worth the wait. Well worth the wait yeah, for that send. Sure. That was awesome. So sure. dope. Cool. Well, uh, I mean, we've been going for a while here. So, I mean, I, th I think that's an, an amazing episode. Yeah, First man, episode, I, huge. Had a great time. Absolutely. Man. I appreciate you for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Really appreciate you being the first guest. I knew I had to start with a banger, and I was like, nobody else but Geo. I mean, there's so much to talk about, so much to recap. So, uh, what's so what's going on with you? I guess the what's next? Just really focusing on the night society and getting after that. Yeah, definitely focusing on night society and you know just trying to create more opportunities for Rutgers student athletes. Like I think, um, you know, right now NIL is like the biggest recruiting tool for for colleges. Like mm -hmm. before, it was facilities. It was you know who looked the richest. Now it's you know who's putting the most money in athletes' pockets. Like how yeah. can you do that? Um, you know, and and obviously since I was at the forefront of it. I feel like it's, like, kind of my duty to make sure that Rutgers has something in place where, mm -hmm. you know, they could tell recruits, like, look, we have the Night Society here where you can make money from it. So definitely locked in on that. I'm also doing starting basketball training in Woodbridge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I got a, a great spot over there. I actually linked up with the mayor over there. So, like, oh, the mayor awesome. like showing a ton of love. Yeah, so looking forward to starting that soon. Haven't haven't started yet, but pretty soon going to be getting that going, and that's going to be really fun. Like, I feel like I've always loved, like, teaching, like, teaching the game, teaching about, you know, my experiences, whatever it may be. Um, you know, and I feel like the kids will love that too. So getting a chance to do that, like, it's going to be really fun for me. And, um, yeah, that's really the two things that I'm locked in on right now. And just, you know, obviously, nope. you know, doing stuff like this, coming to a podcast, yeah. you, know, you know, making appearances at certain places. Like, that's, that's been a lot of fun for me too, just connecting with, with you know, fans, friends, you know, all that. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's been a lot of fun to do that too. That's awesome. So. Dope. Dope. Well, I'm excited to see where everything goes. I'm excited to see because this is just the start of it. So, definitely. you know, I get to be along for the whole journey just to watch. So uh, yeah, I'm we really excited. Got a, we so. definitely got a, a nice side of the event in, in Reds. For oh, sure. we'll definitely line yeah, it we gotta, up. Absolutely. We got to get it going, man. Absolutely. I'll get, get everybody in here, man. That'd be I'm huge. Saying. And I'm hoping to have a couple more of the, the guys on. <laughs> Maybe even Eric the Grand one day would be sweet. But, you know, Ron Harper Jr., when he's back around, you know, I know he's busy doing his thing. But I'm hoping to have a couple other guys follow up with some other good stories. Yeah, so it most should be good. Man, yeah. you, get, you get some good stories from some of those guys for sure. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm really excited for this. So, dope. Dope. Well, that was a great first episode. Thank you again for being the first guest. Really appreciate you coming by. Yeah, man. Appreciate you for having me. Dope. Awesome. And we out. Let's go. That's a banger right there, dog. Let's go. Let's go.